Welcome everyone to tonight's talk, The Evolution of Disaster Capitalism, Fine-Tuning Shock Doctrine Style Policies. And welcome to our panelists. Thank you for coming and sharing your experiences here on this panel tonight. The event is being co-sponsored by The Independent Newspaper, a free newspaper for free people, and of course The Breck Forum. My name is Judith De Los Santos. I'm with the Breck Forum, along with my colleague RuPaul Osa, put together this panel. And uh, we, well, I will be moderating tonight. Unfortunately, we've had a last minute cancellation. Uh, Tracy Washington won't be, she was unable to make it. And so therefore, Beverly Bell will be filling in with uh, a lot of the New Orleans information. Uh, so let me introduce our guest, uh, Ezili Danto of Haitian Lawyers Leadership Network. Beverly Bell of Other Worlds Are Possible, Adana Usmani of Action for a Progressive Pakistan, and Kambale Musabuli of Friends of the Congo. Welcome. <clears throat> the end of the first decade of this new millennium has been marked by some of the worst natural disasters that have displaced and killed millions of people. Worst nat uh, natural disasters. This is what the media has coined as the ma af aftermath we encounter. Where the aftermath is beginning to mirror the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and have generated a complicated and fractured terrain on which human rights and economic justice are seriously compromised. In her book, The Shock Doctrine, Naomi Klein describes this as such. Countries are shocked by war, terror attacks, coup d'etats, and natural disasters. And then they are shocked again by corporations and politicians who exploit the fear and disorientation of this first shock to push through economic shock uh, therapy. In essence, the uses of disaster conditions to push through economic policies that a population would less likely be able to accept under normal circumstances. Within this decade alone, we have seen the earthquake in Jurat, Ju, Juharat, India in 2001, volcanic eruptions in the D Democratic Republic of Congo, in 2002, as well as war conflicts within the Great Lakes uh, region in Africa, the earthquakes in China and Algeria in 2003, the tsunamis of 2004, the earthquakes in Pakistan's Northwest Frontier province in 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans later that same year, the earthquakes in Haiti and Chile, in 2010, and now the cholera outbreak Haiti is currently experiencing, along with Hurricane Tomas. Today we'll take a look at what disaster capitalism has meant in this decade. A concept that is not new, however, with the frequency of occurrences of these disasters, especially in this decade, one has to wonder has disaster capitalism evolved? What does it look like in these specific regions? What trends are evident? Under these circumstances, how are groups organizing? If uh, each of the panels can name some concrete examples of successful uh, campaigns, and how can we support them? And also, uh, we are going to end on the note, what structures of accountability can we strengthen or generate? With that, I give you our first uh, speaker, uh, Izili Danto, who is going to be talking about Haiti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, to the Breg Farm. I think this is my second time here and I truly appreciate it. And I um, thank you for coming and for being interested in Haiti and 
what we do at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership. I was born in Haiti and raised in America. I first went back to Haiti as an attorney for President Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and that was in 1994. And uh, I have been running the Haitian Lawyers Leadership Network since. Um, the experience of that is the reason that I'm s sitting here today. The experience of what folks might call disaster capitalism. I, I say Haitians have been facing the barbarity of the West since 1503 when um, the first boatload of Africans were chained and brought to Haiti the first place that we were, that the Africans were brought to. Um, and so though now it has this name of disaster capitalism, I'm going to talk within the context of what I know as a Haitian woman, as a Haitian lawyer, and as a Haitian activist who went back to Haiti trying to bring a new paradigm to Haiti and finding out that um, the United States Agency for International Development, the US, France, and Canada, and all of the Western countries do not want development in Haiti. So, so that was a wake-up call for me um, because I did believe in, you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag, you know, for you know, justice for all. But for my people, the one person, one vote rule does not apply. For my people, the, um, and, and, and obviously you know there was two Bush coup d'etats against President Javier Aristide, the first democratically elected president of Haiti, um, one in uh, 1991 under Bush Sr. and the other um, 2004 under Bush the Lesser. So, um, and that was because the United States does not want to see the masses of Haiti. There are 10 million people in Haiti, and point, maybe 0.5 percent of the Haitian wealth is owned and mediated by the Haitian oligarchy. And that Haitian oligarchy are the subcontractors for companies that want to use Haitian labor and exploit Haitian labor for the benefit of the world's corporatocracy. But the narrative in Haiti is totally different. You will not learn about the Haitian oligarchy. You won't know who Bijou is, who the Mervs are, who Accra are, who Brants are. And that's really what needs to be done. The, the real, we cannot change what's happening in Haiti without first understanding the lifting up the mask. So if, we, if we're looking at this in terms of um, the shock doctrine, humanitarian aid is used to mask exploitation, or what others call a disaster capitalism. So um, let me give some specific examples. So. Um, there, when I got to Haiti in 1994, it was after three years of, um, of, of a lot of Haitian in the diaspora. Um, that shouldn't be me, I'm so sorry. Um, thank you. Okay, the phone never rings. <laughs> I will take it off. Um, All right, so um, why does the United States uh, keep Haiti contained in poverty? Why? Um, you all know that we just had an a, a earthquake on January 12th, and that earthquake in 33 seconds killed over 300,000 people. I was in Haiti about a week after that, and if they're saying 300,000, I'm going to say to you that it's it's much more than that. I mean, they don't have the figures, really. Because 98% of the rubble, 10, 11 months later, is still on the ground. So if they didn't lift up the rubble, you know, some people still there. They're just decomposing. So we had a situation in Haiti where uh, on January 
you know, 12, the United States came into Haiti on, on the 14th and militarized aid and came in as humanitarians. At least that is the, that is the, that is the uh, handle that, you know, Anderson Cooper and CNN will tell you about, okay? But um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, it's not about Haitian rights. It's not about Haitian uh, development. Haiti is used in various ways by the United States. And, and you can give it the name shock doctrine, you can give it the name disaster capitalism, but for us, capitalism was the reason why there was enslavement, why we had 300 years of being um, property. Okay, so Naomi Klein didn't have to give this a name, we already knew what that name was. This sort of enslavement, sort of chattel enslavement, was taken down by Haiti in 1804. But since that time, now that was after 300 years of slavery, and the, 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 the missionaries came, and, and I think it's the same thing for Africa as it is for Haiti, you know, they told you they were enslaving you in order so that you could, you know, save your soul. Now they tell us they have come to Haiti to help us develop. They have come to Haiti, there's about 16,000 NGOs in Haiti, upwards to 16,000. Before the earthquake, it was about maybe 10,000. Per capita, there are more charitable organizations in Haiti than anywhere else in the world, and yet, and yet, 10 months later, let's look at the statistics, 10 months later, there's the, what, the, the statistics that they're giving, we give higher statistics, but the, the CNN statistics, the mainstream statistics, that there's 1.3 million people on the streets, homeless, living under really tarps, basically, and sheets. It's the hurricane season. Those same people um, lost their property and are living within the rubble. How much money was gathered during that time when you know, CNN and Obama decided that, you know, you need to give your money to Red Cross, you need to give your money to the Bush-Clinton fund. The amount of money that has been collected, uh, approximately, we're saying that um, there's over a billion dollars collected by private charities. Private charities meaning Red Cross, it doesn't have you as a constituency, it has a private board by Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, Oxfam, all of these NGOs, all right? They collect money. Today, if we just look at the Bush-Clinton Fund, what they're saying is that the money they have collected, the Bush-Clinton Fund themselves have collected $52 million, and they're basically saying, you know, 10 months later, we haven't used it, we're collecting interest, the people are dying, now remember, we just had the hurricane season. We're, ha we're in the hurricane season. We've had storms. And I won't get to cholera for a minute, but you all know, since I don't have that much time, so let me just get it to it. It's imported. So they came to us to bring stability, democracy. They destabilized Haiti first, okay? So when I said that the one person, one rule doesn't apply to us, they took down President Aristide, who was duly elected, and deported him to Africa. Why? Because he had raised the minimum wage. Why? Because he had decided that Haitians deserve to have freedom of religion, and Vodun is a religion of Haiti, a spirituality of Haiti, and it should also, in addition to Catholicism and other religions, be, 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 be part of what Haiti is about because he had demobilized the army, which was left to Haiti by the United States during their 19th year occupation. People ask me all the time, why is Haiti the way it is? Why is it uh, uh, poor? I'm just gonna give one example because we don't have time. The independence debt, Haiti paid for 122 years, a debt to France for my ancestors winning their freedom and getting rid of slavery. We had to pay. That payment benefited the United States because of the Louisiana Purchase, which brought the United States 
double its size. And also folks from Louisiana who had moved up from Haiti kept their, um, were paid indemnity. So we helped develop Haiti, um, excuse me, the United States, with a lot, in a lot of different ways. That is our purpose in accordance to Bill Clinton, Mama Clinton, Papa Clinton, Bush, the same. Whether it's Democrats or Republicans, Haitians suffer exactly the same. It's just a different manner of genocide. And right now there is a genocide going on in Haiti. And I, 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 um, I want to give some very specific examples about what that means. So you have um, in Haiti at the moment a, um, a scenario where upwards to 16, well, before January, before the earthquake, we already help, had help in Haiti. We had the UN. And there were, there were 9,000 troops in the UN. They were making $610 million per year. They had been there for six years. So they had collected over $3 billion in our name to bring us democracy, to bring us development. Not one pipe for clean water has been laid in the six years that the UN has been there. Not one. Clinton and Bush were assigned by Obama to come and help us doing this, this, this amazing natural disaster. And, and I, I put natural disaster in quotation marks. You see? So, 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 so um, what did Clinton and Obama do to earn the position of coming to Haiti to be the Clinton-Obama fund to help Haitians recover? What? We know Clinton from the Rwanda genocide. We know Clinton just apologized right after the earthquake for destroying Haiti's agriculture. He apologized. He said, my policies when I was in office helped destroy the Haitian agriculture. So what qualifies him now to be nominated by himself or the UN? It wasn't a Haitian that decided. But now he is the head, co-head with the Prime Minister of Haiti of what they call the Haiti Recovery Committee or whatever that is. So supposedly, Clinton and Mr. the Prime Minister is going to look at what the donor countries, remember I say that the, 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 there's been charitable funds and they say, the, the, the statistics I've read is that uh, out of every household, like half of the American households, opened up their pocketbooks because of the earthquake and gave money to organizations. They expected, when they gave that money, Americans expected it was for emergency help. You see? Today, if you ask any of these folks that collected the money, they're going to say to you, oh, we're holding on to it for long-term development. So they're not using it for emergency help. If you look at the donor countries who pledged money in March of 2010 to Haiti after the earthquake, less than 10% of them have actually given what they have pledged. The United States, for instance, pledged through Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, 1.1 billion to Haiti for development. Not one penny has been delivered with that money. Small, tiny countries have put in their money, like Estonia. But meanwhile, meanwhile, we have this narrative, and this is what I do at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership. If we want something to change in Haiti, we must change the narrative. The narrative, the colonial blueprint, they've used it in Bosnia, they've used it in Congo, they've used it in Rwanda, they've used it everywhere that they've pillaged and plundered and exploited is that Haiti has nothing, no riches, and the United States and the Western countries, Canada and France, have come in to help us. That's the narrative. If you believe that narrative, then you're unconscious then that's a period, not a comma. I've been doing this for a long time. And if you believe what CNN is saying to you, if you believe what um, New York Times is saying to you about Haiti, half of what they say about Haiti is half-truths. 
So they tell you, the narrative is, Haiti has nothing, Haiti is corrupt, violent, and without assets. At the Haitian Lawyers Leadership, we say the exact opposite. We say they have come to plunder and to get riches. We say Haiti's riches is the reason why the United States landed in Haiti 20,000 troops on January 14th. Haiti lies between Venezuela and Cuba. It's strategic place in the arena where the United States wants to govern. Those two countries are two countries that have not followed the capitalist uh, model. You see? And Haitians, Haitian peasants, the tiny Haitian peasants, they have a model that, that, that existed before Lenin and Marx. And that model scares United States policymakers. It is a model where you wake up, you own the property that you're in, and you go out and you eat off of the land, and you work in combination with your neighbors to build. It's called a combite. Tiny, but it's in Haiti. It bothers the United States so much that in their policy, Clinton's policy was to force the Haitians and the outback to move into um, the city and um, work for their factories and become these workers. So when they, they did everything they could to destroy the Haitian peasant, okay? I'm just gonna give you one example. The Haitian peasants had this, the, their livestock, their most important life, livestock was their black pigs. And that's what they used to, they would sell these black pigs at points in time during the season in order to send their kids to, to, to school. The United States came and killed 1.3 million of the Haitians, slaughtered their pigs, slaughtered peasant farmers' livestock because they said that it had um, some sort of a disease which they never could prove. Once they did that and impoverished those Haitian uh, farmers, they, they had to, many of them moved into the city, if the capital of Haiti, and that's where they would meet. And, and, it, and, and, and of course, you know, the idea of um, assembly plans, this is what um, the UN thinks is development for Haiti. The UN says that Haiti wants to be competitive with China. Now they're talking for me. They're talking for Haitians. They say, we want to be competitive for China. What they really mean is this. When Obama is down there in India, he wants to tell the Indian, the Indian government, the Pakistani government, don't you dare raise your raises. Don't you raise your, 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 your minimum wage. Don't raise it to the level where our corporations um, don't want you to raise it. So they will say things like, if you do, we're just gonna take it to Haiti because you pay, we're paying them 25 cents an hour. So they use us in that manner. We're basically, we're basically um, re-enslaved in Haiti, recolonized, but it's um, because the narrative is Haitians have nothing, so if we bring them assembly plants, then we've given them something. I want you to understand that what do we have? There is oil in Haiti, we, we, there is iridium, there is gold doing the um, coup d'etat uh, uh, between President, uh, in the years that President Aristide was there, President Prevost was there, companies from uh, Canada are mining in Haiti. Since 2004 they've been mining. They've been mining in the North Mountains. Um, there are, there are, so, so all of this information you can find on my website. You won't find Haiti's riches anyplace else. No one will tell you that the United States barters Haitians as if, as if we belong to them. You see, Obama will just say, Cheney, Negropana, all of these folks will just say, you know, um, we'll use Haitian labor. Not that they will, eventually, you see, they use that in for their trades. They, um, so the earthquake happened, 
The United States collected all of this money. It's never reached the people. They're still on the streets. And what's worse right now is that um, they've imported to us a new disease, and it's called cholera. Haiti never had cholera before. We have had hurricanes. We have had a lot of uh, 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 flooding in our history. And cholera is a disease that comes through. Uh, uh, it's a waterborne disease where you get diarrhea, and it, it's easily uh, treated. But if there is no sanit if if there is no health uh, infrastructure, people die. Just last week, the CDC went down to Haiti and said that this is from South Asia. It's not Haitian, and it was imported. But we're not going to look at the source. You see, if it was my people. They had brought some disease in the Western Hemisphere, as they said, you know, before with AIDS. Somebody would look to uh, uh, quarantine those that were bringing it. Those soldiers are still there. No one's quarantining anybody. You see, because the value of our lives as Haitians means zilch. Our only purpose is to make money for the charities for the corporations and for the assets of our country to be used by those with monopolies. You know, I think it was Bush that said, I am going to, um, what did he, he said something about the free market system where he was going to uh, eschew the, 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 the free market system in order to save the free market system when he did his bailout. It was something really weird like that, he said. Um, there's never been, truly, a free market system. In Haiti, it's about monopolies. The same family does all of the school uniforms for the entire country, and they've had this monopoly. The same families have a, 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 the fuel monopoly. You know, it's just monopolies, and that's how the United States is. It's like you don't see it, though. Those monopolies in Haiti right now um, the pharmaceutical companies from America, the oil companies from America, you see, they're the ones benefiting from this disaster capitalism. How do they benefit? The United States, Pentagon, the USAID, they... Now, I'll give you that example of the agriculture. I, I said to you that Bill Clinton apologized for destroying Haiti's agriculture. The way they did that was they had uh, subsidized big agribusiness in America, Arkansas farmers, right? They subsidized them, and then they dumped it in Haiti. Excuse me? Okay. And then they dumped, they dumped that in Haiti. Now, when they did that, right, the, 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 the small Haitian farmer who was bringing his, 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 his uh, crops to market couldn't compete with stuff that was dumped in Haiti from big agribusiness. So he moved, or his family had to move into the city to try to find factory jobs. When the Chinese brought down their labor force, or the Indians brought down their labor force, the factories that were in Haiti left and went over there. And that left the slums of Cité Soleil, the people that had moved into the area of the capital. That's why you have Cité Soleil. Now those folks in Cité Soleil, at some point in time, around 19, um, you know, they helped to bring President Aristide to power. They were massacred by the folks that the United States of America trained at Fort Benning or at Ecuador, who headed the Haitian army massacred between, between 1991 to 1994 when President Aristide came back, okay? And that was Bush the first coup d'etat. So when I say to you the legacy of impunity and violence, it normally comes from the supporting of the oligarchy and imperialism in Haiti. So, so, so as a lawyer, when I went back to Haiti, I thought that I could uh, bring about judicial reform. Clinton said he wanted Haitians to go and help Haiti. That was back in 
1994. But when I got to Haiti, I was told that unless I work for an NGO, unless I work for a USAID, unless I work to bring about the uh, idea of Haiti that the United States wanted, which is they want us to look like the Dominican Republic, they want us look, to look like Jamaica, where we're maids, butlers, and um, props to a tourist industry, and where your land is owned by foreign tourists and the Haitian oligarchy, and you're just like props, you're just their maids and butlers, okay? So that is what the United States, is. I call it false benevolence, at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership, we do the counter-colonial narrative. We were the first to bring, to push this cholera that is not Haitian, and push and try to get mainstream media like the Reuters and Al Jazeera and, uh, and um, so forth, to actually go to the place where the Nepalese base are, where the soldiers were putting their raw feces into the Haitian river that gave the people this cholera. But you won't hear this on CNN because we're supposed to be diseased. But if we had been diseased, remember we have hurricanes and flooding all the time in Haiti. You would have known about it a long time ago. So they have brought to us all of this destruction, destroying of our agriculture, destroying of our uh, livestock, destruction of our, even our health, and destruction of our ability, or when we try to, to, to elect a president that would use the assets of the country to develop the country and to bring sanitation, uh, communication, electricity, uh, health. The United States says you've got to leave that to the free market. One thing, let me just say, can you quickly mention something about the mining industry, very quickly, just a few comments? So, yes, um, the, the, there are mining, mining companies, that, they didn't like what President Aristide wanted. What President Aristide wanted in Haiti um, was to have a, a, a sort of what, what America has that it doesn't, doesn't talk about, a mixed economy, sort of a private, public partnership where the assets of the country, because you know, he had identified the assets of the country for the first time for the people of Haiti, and they were mining, I mean, excuse me, there were gold and iridium and all these, and they're, they're in the north of Haiti in the mountains. We are a country of lots of mountains, and we are one of the oldest land masses of the Americas. So, so it's very pure um, 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 uh, uh, products. These um, companies, once, we be, once the Bush administration brought in uh, the UN occupation, they, there's no concern, there's nothing about Haitian environmental protection. There's nothing about you know, what, is, what, what are Haitians getting out of this mining. So mining has been going on in Haiti since 2004 for, for, by uh, companies like Majesco, St. Genevieve, um, companies that come from America, and they're mining. And, and the, um, I wrote, actually, in 2009, and today people are quoting it. I, someone quoted it and, and sent it to me because I had totally forgotten. I, I, I have a piece out that says, um, um, uh, uh, did the mining in Haiti cause the earthquake? Because drilling does uh, destabilize fault lines. And so I had asked that question. But in asking those questions, I, I um, had talked about the fragility of the Haitian environment and, and how we have been exploited for so long. And I had asked, what, is it, what, what would happen if these benevolent folks came in and poisoned the Artibonite area, which is the area of where the Haitian breadbasket is, where we actually fed our people for, for centuries. And today, the, the cholera didn't start out in Port-au-Prince where the people are in the streets. It started in the rural area. And it's because of, of the poisoning of the Artiboni River. Um, so mining in Haiti is going on right now. For gold mining, you know they use all sorts of toxic chemicals. And those things are seeping into the system. Our people have no, no health um, protection, no environmental protections. So, so, so it, we, ha we don't even know what the um, significance of all of that mining is because 
Haitians have been disenfranchised and we are under occupation. Thank you very much. We'll take questions afterwards when all of the panelists have had a chance to speak. Next up, we have uh, Beverly Bell of Other Worlds Are Possible. Thank you, I'm so delighted to be here. And I have um, a dual perspective on the world as a fourth generation New Orleanian who was born, raised, and live in New Orleans and who has worked in Haiti with popular movements for 30 years. So I'm going to speak about both, a little bit of comparison, building off of what Ezuli spoke about, but also adding a little bit of a New Orleans um, element to it. You all probably know there have always been many similarities between Haiti and the U.S. They are historic, they are cultural, they go deep, they are very strong. People in New Orleans are extremely proud of them today, but perhaps they've never been closer, certainly not economically, than since Katrina and the subsequent flooding in 2005 and then the Haitian earthquake of January 2010. On the plane this morning coming up from New Orleans, I was trying to make a list of the comparisons between New Orleans and Haiti in terms of disaster capitalism. A brief list and I got up to about six pages. So it's, they're, they're very, very deep and I'll just try and pare them down very quickly because I don't have much time. But in both cases we have seen how poverty and capitalism represent big business. It's what Jordan Flaherty in his wonderful, wonderful new book, Floodlines, sort of the consummate story of disaster capitalism in New Orleans. I can't recommend it enough. But it's what he called corporatization, militarization, and privatization of aid. In, oh, this is loud. in both cases, the devastation of the catastrophe was only partly about nature. Remember that Hurricane Katrina didn't even hit New Orleans. It actually dodged New Orleans but it was mainly about the context of classism, racism, and exclusion. In both cases, black people were characterized as savages who needed to be policed. In both cases, the media falsely reported looting and violence in what was actually a very calm situation. In Louisiana, Governor Blanco put out a shoot to kill order. And in Haiti, the very first response to this traumatized and devastated nation was to send in the military, as Ezuli said, 20,000 U.S. troops and 12,500 U.N. troops. In both cases, the majority population, which is extremely poor, was left out of all formal decision making and has not benefited from these decisions. Both peoples have been denied the right to return, guaranteed in the UN principles for inter internally displaced people. And this right to return includes, among other things, quote, full participation in the planning and management in their return or resettlement and reintegration. And, quote, the right to participate fully and equally in public affairs at all levels and to have equal access to public services. In both places, we have seen disaster aid turned into aid disasters. In both cases, aid was diverted to outsiders to control it because it was believed that the local population was too corrupt. In both cases, the elite have been seeking to remake the area in their own image, that is a more efficient Western dominant culture image, minus the backward third world element. Both cases created new maneuvering room for these new neoliberal models to be imposed. Just to give one indicator, in a few days after the storm in New Orleans, the Foundry, which is the blog of the Heritage Foundation, said, quote, few people could have predicted the improvements in education that would result, but sometimes things get so bad that radical change can happen. Days after the earthquake in Haiti, that same blog published a piece entitled Amidst the Suffering, Crisis in Haiti Offers Opportunities to the U.S. And in this article they said, in addition to providing immediate humanitarian assistance, the U.S. response to the tragic earthquake in Haiti 
offers opportunities to reshape Haiti's long dysfunctional government and economy, as well as to improve the public image of the United States in that region. You won't find this on the website because people made such a scandal after it was seen that they immediately took it down. Both New Orleans and Haiti have been sources of profit based on the exploitation of others. In New Orleans, the developers, who are for the most part rich and white, have made money off of development itself and off of tourism, which is really nothing more than the marketing of the fruits of African American culture to people which in this case were meant to exclude the African Americans that New Orleanians were delighted to get rid of. In Haiti, as Ezuli mentioned, the reconstruction plan, the linchpin of redevelopment of both the U.S. and the U.N. is the expansion of sweatshops, where people earn a pitifully unlivable wage of $3.09 a day. Both have had reconstruction based on legalized subminimum wage, in Haiti, this is happening as cash for work programs, cleaning up rubble, through which there has been an exemption in the minimum wage. And in New Orleans, it's primarily through Latino laborers. And for this, Bush suspended the Davis-Bacon Act, which protects minimum wage and other workers' rights. There was a huge uprising about this, too, and he had to reverse that decision. But he actually said that it was OK not to pay minimum wage in New Orleans. In both cases, there, were there has been huge money for repair and reconstruction going to outside experts, both NGOs and corporations. This is in part, as I mentioned, because the elite doesn't believe that the local people are up to the challenge. But in Haiti and New Orleans both, what we see are many U.S. contracts going to multinationals well connected to the U.S. administration and to nobody more than the Clintons. There is a revolving door in contracts from Iraq, to Afghanistan, to New Orleans, to Haiti, especially in terms of security. Many of these are no-bid contracts, and they're going to friends of the Clintons and others well-placed in Washington. Since Ezuli spoke mainly about Haiti, I'll just touch on a few elements of the disaster capitalism as it's manifested in New Orleans. We saw this model that had two elements to it in New Orleans, and we're still seeing it. One is ethnic cleansing and the other is privatization. The ethnic cleansing, it was really remarkable for me as a white person who has the rare privilege, I guess, of having other white people as, you know, assume commonality with me and thus open their mouths and say the most unbelievable things, to hear things like one woman say to me, one good thing that came from Katrina is a change in population, so now finally we'll be able to elect some good people. Good, of course, being code for white. We all heard Barbara Bush visit the Astrodome in Houston right afterwards where there were all of these desperate people living, you know, like animals on these cots long further than they ever should have stayed there. And she said, you know, they were underprivileged anyway, so this is working out very well for them. I could go on and on and on, but you all know this already. Of the 100,000 people who never returned home, most of them were black and poor because they had no right to return. Now white folk in New Orleans have both financial and political power. I could give many, many examples, but I don't have time. But just to give you one, one in four black-owned businesses in New Orleans and in Biloxi have closed down since Katrina. And this is a rate 52 times higher than white-owned businesses. This May, the people elected a white mayor of the city for the first time in 32 years. He, his election was largely supported by the African-American population, but this is a place we would not have gotten to in the past. And we now have a predominantly white city council for the first time in decades. Privatization is the second element, and this has been extraordinary. New Orleans has really been an experiment of what it means to fully privatize the system. And Hurricane Katrina and the resulting disaster gave them the opportunity they need, and I'll take it in the three major social elements, education, housing, and health care, the three fundamentals uh, that, that people can maybe expect to receive some help from in the state, unless you're from New Orleans. In terms of education, Milton Friedman, I'm sure you all know the father of uh, neoliberal ideology, came out of retirement a few months after Katrina at the age of 90 came out of retirement specifically to write a piece in the Wall Street Journal, an editorial, that said, this is a tragedy. 
It is also an opportunity to radically reform the educational system. One of the very first acts of city government after Katrina was to fire the entire public school system staff, 7,500 people from administrators and headmasters to teachers to janitors. At the same time, the city withdrew recognition of the union. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure that's a wholly illegal act, but many things have been. The public school system has since been gutted, and currently three quarters of the New Orleans schools are managed charters, and I have heard that there are plans to fully do away with public schooling in New Orleans. They created something called the Recovery School District, which manages 34 traditional schools and another 33 that are independently run, which operates completely outside of the New Orleans government. Power was taken away from the New Orleans government, and it has very, very little uh, power from the teachers union. One of the things that they have done and are going to continue to do is to put in the largest core of Teach for America that has ever existed. And while Teach for America youth have a lot to offer the schools, the kids have often been used as a way to undermine teachers unions. Because here you have these volunteers who come in and take the power away. It's very interesting to note that the man who is the head of the recovery school district in New Orleans, who oversaw this whole thing, is now the architect of the blueprint working with Bill Clinton and the UN in Haiti to remake the school systems in Haiti. He said it's going to be the revolu greatest revolution that Haiti has seen. Housing. After Katrina, homelessness rose. You can imagine. We lost half of our housing there, or it was damaged, with almost 5% of the city, or 12,000 people, homeless. So at the same time as you have 12,000 people on the streets, public housing projects were not damaged in the storm. They were among the few buildings that weren't because they were brick. They were structurally sound. Those houses were mainly empty, as most residents, who were black and poor, had been evacuated. But instead of making that housing available to homeless people, what did the city do? It decided that this was the time, this time of massive crisis in housing, when so many others, not included in this homeless statistic, could not return home because their home was ruined and they had nowhere to go, so they were living on their auntie's floor in Atlanta, or somewhere in Houston, or somewhere in Seattle, or anywhere. Instead, the city decided to demolish all of the public housing after Katrina. Just to give one example, um, there was one public housing project that would have cost $85 million to renovate, but $100 million to demolish. What did they do? They chose to demolish it. It makes no point of view from the, it makes no sense from the point of view of financial logic, but in terms of disaster capitalism at work, excuse me, at work, and the ideology of neoliberalism, it makes a lot of sense. Healthcare, this is perhaps the most shocking. Before the storm, New Orleans had one public hospital called Charity. It was created in 1736, and it treated hundreds of thousands of patients per year. It was number two in the country in terms of trauma treatment. This building was not structurally damaged. It suffered damage in the basement, but it wasn't damaged, and the military immediately cleaned it up to where it could be reopened immediately. And what you had were people who were traumatized, who had lost their access to you know, mental health drugs, to all sorts of medical care, who were homeless, who desperately needed care. Here's Charity Hospital ready to go, structurally sound and cleaned up. And guess what? Three weeks after Katrina, the Louisiana uh, state government chose to close it down. They selected this moment to close the thing down. It's closed to this day. I'm sure that they will never reopen it. And they have since destroyed all the records of people who have been treated there ever since their birth. Mm -hmm. Didn't even announce this and give people the chance, for example, who might have been living outside of, of New Orleans at the time, waiting to come home, the chance to come back and get their records. No alternative health care has been offered, and low-income people are without free options. So you can actually see how the ethnic cleansing and the privatization work hand in hand. One keeps the other from coming home, but of course it does far more in a nation that is just hell-bent on privatizing everything. In terms of citizen response, back to the comparison between New Orleans and Haiti, there's been so much grassroots organizing to switch the power balance, to get people's voice included in the decision making, and to ensure that the corporations and the developers and the government and other ne'er-do-wells are not profiting from their misery. Because after all, who knows better than the majority what they need? Uh, and who should benefit most about decisions from reconstruction than those who were most adversely impacted? 
Here I'll speak more about the case of Haiti because that's where uh, most of my work has been with peasant movements and women's movements and democracy movements and human rights movements and others. Here the people's perspective since January 12th has been sorely, sorely lost. Ezuli referred to this interim commission. This is actually the most pernicious thing and everyone in the United States needs to know this and please leave here and tell 20 people. Haiti is now legally a protectorate. There was a constitutional coup that occurred in mid-April and Haiti is now run by something called the Interim Commission for the Reconstruction of Haiti. Its mandate is for 18 months, 18 months coinciding with the state of emergency that the parliament voted in. What the Haitian parliament did was vote to cede all of its powers over to this body, which keeps growing, but at last count it was 28, 14 Haitians, and 14 foreigners. And how do you get a seat on this august body? You buy it. So it's the inter, um, it's the IMF, it's the World Bank, it's the Inter-American Development Bank, it's the, it's Canada, it's the U.S., it's France, it's all of these powers, the UN, and the way you get a seat on it is that your institution has either given 100 million since the earthquake, or canceled 200 million in debt, which of course debt, which whose principal has long been paid anyway, to Haiti. This is totally secret body. Most Haitians, even radicals, even students, even people who care profoundly know nothing about it and there's no way to find out anything about it. There are no public statements, there is no phone number that you can call, there is to be no report issued. So uh, power has completely been taken away from the Haitian people and they have no idea who has taken it or why. I've been able to scout around and have published everything I've found and a few other folks in Haiti have too but almost no one knows and this is their country. They elected a president. The single shred of power that the Haitian president has is to veto what the CIRH, this interim commission, decides. But everyone knows that President Preval won't do that, and we're pretty sure that whatever president they allow to come in as of November 28th and the new elections will not be allowed to do that too. And again, because the government has been basically dissolved and everything is happening behind closed doors, we'll have no way of knowing even if there is a free election in Haiti. So of course, given this, this this CIRH, this commission, whose mandate is to determine the development path of Haiti, which of course means giving it full power for the restructuring of the whole financial and economic condition of the country, the Haitian people have absolutely no one who is accountable to them, who, in whom they have a democratic voice. So you can imagine for the popular movement, this weakens their capacity a lot. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Fortunately, in Haiti, much more so than in New Orleans, there is this strong tradition of organizing among popular movements. Who comprises the popular movements? It's the peasants that Ezuli spoke of, it's women, it's youth, it's students, it's radical clergy and laity, it's workers, it's unemployed, it's shanty town dwellers, it's market women. It is all of these things that has made Haiti such a vibrant and radical culture. Haitian people will tell you with pride, we are a rebellious society. And yes, they attain this incredible incredible slave re revolution in 1804 and they have never ever stopped advocating for what they know to be theirs. Beginning the week of the earthquake, even when some people still didn't know where their child was, who was trapped under rubble, even though they may have just buried their partner that morning, even though they may have a leg still in the cast from when a building fell on them, the week of the earthquake, these groups began assembling to determine their say in the future of the country. And there's a very clear consensus on the priorities for reconstructing the country or what many Haitians call constructing the country because they say we want nothing that reconstructs what we had before because what we had before only serves a small elite, this group that Ezuli spoke of. And so I'll just give you a briefly what the points are in the reconstruction of Haiti. One is creating... One point. Uh, actually, before you continue, can you just, uh, uh, as part of that, can you include what is the return and resettlement strat strategy, Drag 5? Mm -hmm. If you can. Yep. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I will add that into. Yes, I will. Uh, okay, so the first is uh, creating participatory democracy. And this is, again, as I mentioned before, the government must serve the people and be accountable to them and include their participation. Second is rebuilding under a new economic paradigm 
one which breaks free of the old path where agricultural production is undermined by unfair trade rules, where food and many other basics are imported, and where a coveted job is working as a sweatshop worker. Social movements are just adamant that Haiti from here on out has to include principles of economic justice, including rules that privilege Haitian producers and Haitian goods, food sovereignty, employment opportunities, and workers' rights. Putting social needs at the center is critical, and here there is no group more needy and more deserving and, and more unjustly treated than the 1.5 or so million people who are still living 10 months after the way that pigs might live on a farm. They have no roof. They have uh, shredded tarps, most of them, where rains are coming in. So many of them were destroyed in this most recent tropical storm and in earlier storms. They have no floor, so they're sleeping in the mud. They're completely exhausted and sick all the time, even pre-cholera, because of this. And so 10 months later, we have finally, with the help of some investigative journalist friends, found the plan for the U.S. and the U.N. that no one has ever known because it's never been made available to the people. And it is this three-point plan um, um, that Judith just referred to, that is utterly absurd. It lays out plans for a technical um, shift in these camps, like returning people to their homes. But something like 96, uh, 95 to 98 percent of the rubble, as Ezuli said, is still remaining on people's homes. I mean, this rubble is huge. This is not a little rubble. It's like, you know, you walk down the streets where there are hills the size of this room that are filled with rubble. So every single element of that point is absurd, and furthermore, there is no political will to get these people out of camps. They've just been forgotten, like the folks in New Orleans in the formaldehyde-filled FEMA trailers. So people are saying, and I got this list, I sat down with a group of women in a refugee camp, and this was the list that they came up with, so I can't think of anybody who is more expert than they in terms of what their social needs are, and this is the priority they gave. Housing first, food, health care, education, and work. So they're demanding that this be placed at the center of the reconstruction. Privileging agriculture. In a country where the rural farming population comprises 65 to 80 percent, depending on who you ask, redeveloping peasant agriculture is critical. It's been destroyed in two ways. One is by two IMF standby agreements that reduce trade tariffs, in some cases from 50 percent to 0.5 percent. Hmm? Yep. And uh, the second is um, today by the dumping of uh, food aid by U.S. agriculture, which, made it, which has made it almost impossible for farmers to compete. I'll cut it right there. Um, I'm just going to close oh. with one little okay. paragraph here. Okay. Um, yep. I'm just going to say that the last is ensuring women and children's rights. But I just want to close with one very common expression of the, the sentiment of the Haitian people and their determination. And this is a quote by a man who works at the platform to advocate alternative development in Haiti named Lico Jean-Pierre. And you can hear this exact same sentiment um, and the hope and the faith and the determination behind it expressed all over Haiti. He said, sadness can't discourage us so that we stop fighting. We've lost people as in many battles, but we have to continue fighting to honor them and make their dreams a reality. The dream is translated into a slogan, another Haiti is possible. All right, thank you so much, Beverly. Now we have Kambale Mosabili of Friends of the Congo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Try to wake you guys up. Good evening. Good evening. Good, 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 good. Um, my name is Kambala. I work for Friends of the Congo. Uh, we are an advocacy group based out of Washington, D.C. And what we do is we raise awareness globally about the situation in the Congo. We try to provide support and uh, networks uh, to people who are on the ground, um, who are fighting day in and day out for the past, I don't know, 400 years to try to create some sovereignty. Uh, where, whereby the people of the Congo are controlling the resources. And from uh, all the discussion that ju they have just spoken, the one thing that's really common from Haiti uh, to New Orleans is resource exploitation. And what I've seen in the work that we do is that uh, it's really rare to connect the dot, that uh, for people to advocate to end apartheid and forget Liberia, or for people to try to solve the issue of New Orleans and forget Haiti or for people to try to end the killing of six million Congolese there and forget that Nepal and India have an issue that we have to deal with with the water. 
So the issue of exploitation around the world is all connected and it's, it's really going to be up to us, uh, people who understand it, to, to know that, as um, Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So um, I wrote up a few points in regard to uh, disaster capitalism, you know, speaking even uh, to Judith earlier. You know, uh, we can use that term, uh, but at the end of the day, it's really exploitation of the people where you are maximizing profit and not considering uh, the human beings living on the land as human beings, but as, more so as commodities that you can remove uh, from different areas. Uh, in the context of the Congo, you know, the war officially ended in 2002, and that's really where we saw how disaster capitalism really came into play, where we saw directly the IMF and World Bank coming in into the Congo, and they actually wrote the mining laws and the forestry laws of the Congo. And as they came in, uh, they literally bankrupted a state, uh, a state fir uh, mining firm called Jekamine, who controlled most of the assets of the country, where they privatized uh, the, uh, the mining assets of the country and gave it to foreign corporations. You know, we saw the Freeport McMurray coming in. We saw Barrow out of Canada coming in. Uh, we saw even um, Adastra, which was American mining field, and was so common about everything that we're saying, the same name came coming up, but nobody has arrested him yet. Bill Clinton, you know, he has done a lot of things around the world, and some of the situation that we are seeing in the Congo unfold today is due to U.S. foreign policy under the Bill Clinton administration, uh, where they, they favor strong men uh, who will give unfettered access to the resources. Um, so the other thing that happened also, besides just um, stripping the mining assets from uh, Jekamine, uh, one of the uh, top mining companies in the Congo, um, they fired, as soon as they uh, privatize um, the asset, they fired their employees. And some of the things that pro they promised their employees was a pay, a compensation for them losing the job. Up till today, they haven't received that pay. Um, the, the laws as I share with you, that govern how we mine really was written by the IMF World Bank. So how we cut the trees in the Congo, for example, is really uh, in a way where we don't even understand it's going to affect our ecological system. You know, Congo has the second largest rainforest in the world. Uh, did you know that there is a serious problem with an American company here uh, the fro uh, cutting trees like there is no tomorrow? He's an American guy. Nobody knows his name living right here in New Jersey. Look him up, Elwin Blackner, right here in New Jersey. And he runs Elwin Blackner. Elwin is E-L-W-I-N, a uh, Y-N, and Blackner is B-L-A-T-T-N-E-R. There is a documentary called Enjoy Poverty 3 uh, that was done by Renzo Martins, uh, where he filmed uh, him in the Congo. Uh, because uh, the situation with this guy is kind of interesting. So he has this plantations that he took over. Some of them are around uh, the Lake Maindombe, and the Lake Maindombe, historically, is where Leopold II hid a plantation that all the foreign nations did not know. That's actually one of the plantations that got him in trouble. Beside other nations exploiting resources a hundred years ago in the Congo, in the Lake Maindombe, he had a closed plantation that nobody knew, and he was exploiting it at a, I mean, a maximum profit, getting rubber out of the Congo. So that area uh, right now, Elwin Blackner, his firm is the Blackner Group, owns it. And th they are cutting trees and getting into the rainforest. And uh, he has about six plantations. And the average employee uh, numbers of employees in the plantation is about 3,000 employees per plantation. 3,000, about 3,000. Uh, and uh, just to give you an example of how much the employees in the plantation are paid, one of them was asked uh, by Renzo, uh, asked, have you ever bought a TV? He said, no. Oh, have you ever bought a suit? No. How long have you been working? 10 years. You haven't been able to save money to buy a suit or a coat? I said, oh, if I work a little hard, you know, I'm, I'm going to get more money. And while he was talking to him, he was just laid off. Now, here's how interesting the concept of laid off is. You are laid off, but you have to come to work to prove that you can work again. So he was working at the plantation as an unofficial employee, not getting a salary, so he could get his job back. And he was being interviewed by Renzo for that. So now, the other issue that took place was that the children in that village, 
uh, the, the different villages who are around have issues on malnutrition. You know, you have kids who are really sick, and I mean, really horrific images. I was even uh, angry when I watched the film because Renzo filmed these kids there. Then he took the, uh, the um, Doctors Without Borders, did the studies around the village. They had the documentation of uh, what was happening there. Of course, there was no pressure on Erwin Blattner. So he takes the footage and he goes sees Erwin Blattner. Of course, he didn't know why he was filming him. And then, in the middle of the interview, so he presents him the fact. You no, know, you have a, these children in this village who are malnourished and this and that. And the most outrageous thing I heard from his mouth was his defense. He said, well, uh, let's say I have a thousand children in these villages who are malnourished. If about eight or 18 of them die, I'm doing pretty good. Now, this guy knew that there are people who are dying there of malnutrition and his employees are not paid and still was able to say that on camera. You know why he said that on camera? Because it was done in French and he never knew that it's gonna be translated in English and be shown now here around the world. But of course, i share with you, he's right in New Jersey, take the PATH train, say hello to his house. <laughs> Citizen arrest. I hope you guys can perform that whenever you are able. <laughs> I'll make sure that you get that. But uh, now to, to come back to even Naomi Klein's uh, perspective of disaster capitalism, uh, to show you without getting into the more details of what is happening now. Simple facts. Six million people have died since 1996. Half of them are children under the age of five. 500,000 are women brutally raped, all in an attempt to get access to Congo's resources. Something in Haiti, something in New Orleans. But it's happening right now. The worst crisis since World War II, the deadliest conflict today. But in that context, in 2002, when the Congo was at its weakest test, that's when the imperialist powers came in with the IMF and World Bank to institute laws that govern how we control our land. And with that, Congo has been sold a wholesale for the next generations, that it will take a leadership from the people to really reverse the current currents, uh, the current that's taking place right now. Now, what are people doing? You know, there are a lot of issues I can talk about. I can talk about the rebels in the East who, are, who have control of the East. I can talk about the government in, the, in Kinshasa, in the West of Congo, who ruled by the gun and have kept people in check. You speak up, you killed. You know, they killed uh, Amatungulu, uh, supposedly who was an activist who threw a stone at uh, the president's convoy. Um, he was arrested and uh, supposedly he committed suicide in his prison cell. Uh, we have another one, Chebea, who died June the 1st, also a strong activist. So many people who speak up in the civil society and people who are fighting, they are in harm's way, just like during the apartheid movement. Now, what are they doing? Um, I will speak about Katanga, because that's where the most vibrant labor movement is located. Uh, and Katanga to my standard, is the richest area of the Congo. That's what, what you don't hear about. The largest copper reserve in the world is located in Katanga and is controlled by an American company called Freeport McMoran. You don't hear about that. 64% of the cobalt in the world, a mineral that is essential to the aerospace and military industry of the United States, is in the Zambia Congo uh, belt, copper belt. You have companies there such as OM Group out of Cleveland, Ohio, who are getting that uh, cobalt, but they were able to receive it at wholesale price due to the mining laws of first law that existed and an elite government um, that is giving them a fair access to those resources. Um, now, with the resistance, the most successful, uh, what are the, the civil society doing? They are writing, they are writing a report, they are uh, publishing it, and they are providing it to porters. So some of the civil society in Katanga publishing their report have been able to get it down to South Africa, to Southern Africa Resource Watch. Uh, we close carbon, but we make sure that people know what is happening with the Freeport McMoran and what they're supposed to do. But the challenge now with what they're publishing is to getting it to the American civil society so that the labor movement here can connect with the people who are in the Congo, just like we did with South Africa. Uh, the second thing that uh, we saw from the civil society, um, I think in around 2004, if I'm not mistaken, I hope uh, my date is correct, uh, 
the civil society initiated a mining review of the contract because we had many mining, com uh, mining companies who came in while the conflict was happening to get sweet deals. Uh, some of the, the average percentage that came back to the Congolese state was around 12% for most of the mining operations. But through civil society push, uh, they actually had some partners here who kind of helped. The Carter Center at uh, Atlanta kind of helped. And some of the uh, Southern African Resource Watch in South Africa and uh, some uh, Dutch organization pushing to renegotiate those contracts. Uh, the Lutundula Commission was launched, found out that about 65 companies were, I mean, their country was really odious and definitely detrimental to the company. I mean, you have a company such as Banro, who has a gold mine right where the conflict is taking place in Eastern Congo, and they make a 100% profit on the gold that, that comes out of there. They made an initial payment to rebels, and they don't make anything to the, uh, to the country. So with that pressure on the civil society, that created the uh, a mining review. It was a very good action from the civil society who really, I mean, made people were really uh, attacked for the actions on the ground. But they pushed through and it went through. But what, what was unfortunate with the mining review was that the government took it and now is using it to bribe, uh, to blackmail mining corporations. I said, oh, well, the Congolese say you need to renegotiate, but you need to pay some $150 million. Uh, let me change the number. $17 million for illegal immigration that Freeport McMurray did, supposedly, so that you can stay in power. But at the same time, that's not benefiting the people. So that's why it's very important with the labor and civil society who are fighting in Congo to be connected with you, just as the free uh, South African movement was there. So while people are advocating for issues there, you can show up here and say, it's not okay for Freeport McMurray to bribe politicians in the Congo. How do you know that? Because you have labor movement in the Congo where provided you with the information of what is happening. Uh, some of the movement uh, also within Katanga was a blockage of roads. Uh, there is a main road that goes, I think, to Ndola. In many, uh, many instances, the workers organized to block those roads because that's where the transit of the copper and cobalt leaving the Congo goes through. It goes through Zambia, then it finds its way out. And they've organized uh, sometimes successfully, uh, but of course with the paramilitary forces and private securities that exist into mine, many of uh, you guys may not be aware of that. Uh, sometimes those forces, are, the labor forces are crushed, you know, either shot, killed, but they continue, of course, to do those blockage. Um, the last point I will, I will add in terms of that, I'm insisting in connecting you here with what is happening on the ground. And I only spoke to you from one aspect of what is happening in the Congo, looking at what are people doing in the Katanga province to address the issues they have, the labor movement that exists. But what you should know about the Congo is they have a very vibrant civil society, a very vibrant labor movement. The challenge that they face is that they are not connected with people around the world. So, Free Pop McMoran is not just in Congo. It's also in uh, Equatorial Guinea. Some of the companies, I'm, I think I'm going to look them up with some Jesco Saint Genevieve to see how they are also connected uh, with uh, the different companies who are there. They all work on a global level, but we are addressing countries by countries, issues by issues, not realizing that it's not really about Palestine. You have Benny Steinman's in the Congo with an Israeli, Dan Gottler in the Congo with an Israeli, making billions of dollars. He made $175 million in five months. Do you want to know how he made that? So, Congolese government take away a mine from a Canadian company called First Quantum. Very big fuss. People do not understand the geopolitical aspect of that contract. First Quantum received that mine. Oh, Bill Clinton is coming back again. So, Bill Clinton's homeboy, his name is Jean Raymond Bull. He's a Canadian guy. He's actually uh, from um, Il Maurice, I don't know. Mauritius, there you go. He's from Mauritius, right? And uh, he has a Canadian passport. I had this American company called American Mineral Field, based out of where? Hope, Arkansas. During the war in the Congo, he provided the rebels with airplanes, and money. He actually flew investors from the US 
to the Congo a week before the rebels took over the country in 1997. He received from that a gold, a, I'm sorry, a diamond concession worth one billion dollars. He's all the own boy. I'm sorry to be saying that because they make me so angry because I know the names and how they operate. Uh, Robert Stewart, who worked for Bechtel, was able to provide um, logistical support for rebels. Do you know what that means? Bechtel worked in NASA, so they have access to NASA satellites, and they provided the logistics to rebel forces taking, coming into Congo. So in all that sweet deal, they made money. So here's now how it become complicated. It's the company is called American Mineral Fields. It comes out in the news, a lot of bad names, uh, things of the nature. They changed the name of the company. You saw that with Blackwater. So the company becomes Adastra. So people will not know this is the same company that worked with rebels. Then after the mining review goes around, they start taking away the, uh, the mining companies away from some of this, this company. They, change it. They, they don't change the name, but they sell it to someone else. They sell it to First Quantum, which is the Canadian mining firm. So First Quantum was listed there. Now here's how crazy this is. Now, the companies looting the Congo are invested. They have investment from the World Bank. How so? The International Finance Corporation, in the tune of $1 billion, have risk uh, insurance, so equity stake, within First Quantum. So it's in their best interest that this company looting the Congo is not out. And they wrote the mining laws and they wrote the forest laws so they know how they can get in there for the contract. Last year, uh, for the past two years, there have been a serious clash between China and the U.S. because of Congo's copper and Congo's cobalt. First, no, they cancel first quantum, cancel Freeport uh, Mac McMoran contract. It was a big fuss. Wait a minute. Freeport McMoran, World Bank, through I uh, IFC, has investment in it. First Quantum have investment in it. So, one of the rebel leaders in the Congo tells the Congolese government, I'm not going to stop fighting until you renegotiate the Chinese contract. Laurent Kunda is removed on the Financial Times. This was actually written on the Financial Times. The IMF publicly come and said, we are not happy with the Chinese contract coming to get what? Um, well, it was uh, what? 10 million tons of copper and 600,000 tons of cobalt. That's a lot of, that's a huge number, right? Uh, well, Freeport McMoran has 100 million tons of copper, which is 10 times the Chinese. That's just one company. Not a story. Yeah, to me, I'll finish that up. So we've, we've uh, now, IMF coming publicly saying, we need you to renegotiate that. The Congolese government decided to do so. So it's been a long talk going on what is going to happen. Hillary Clinton shows up in the Congo. All you heard about it? In the news, what you heard about her was that she went to see the rape victim. She's going to give us $17 million. But what you didn't know was when she was flying into Congo, she was with the head of the IMF and World Bank. When they left the Congo, the $9 billion contract of China became $6 billion. Freeport had problem with the Congo. They made sure that it was, uh, I, the words that I received, that she made clear that we need to make sure that the American company is taken care of. The Congolese government didn't hear that. So in the beginning of this year, uh, our black boy, what's his name? I'm sorry to call him black boy, he's an elder too. Ambassador Carson goes to the Congo. <laughs> Ambassador Carson at the State Department. He goes to the Congo and in a press conference in Kinshasa, he says, we would like the Congolese government to normalize the situation with Freeport McMoran. Now, this is a company that displaced people, caused environmental degradation, have the largest copper reserve and had on the mining review less than 12% profit given to the Congo. Now, an ambassador is saying that. But with all of these games, right, what we will end up talking about is what? Africans wantonly killing each other, not even showing where the weapon factory exists, not even talking about the oligarchs who control uh, the situation there, and who are the real money changers. And I hope after tonight, we all can connect and connect the dots don't just fight for the Congo. I don't want you to come and help the Congo. I want you to help the world because all this situation is the same people, Bill Clinton, for example, doing that all around the world. And we really need the support of ordinary people to come together to address this issue of disaster capitalism. Thank you.
Okay, so now we have Adonar Usmani. Adonar Uh, hi, good evening, guys. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just go quickly because I, I feel like uh, time is short. Um, so, so in the time that I have, I, I want to basically do two things um, uh, to address this sort of topic at hand, uh, disaster capitalism, specifically disaster capitalism in Pakistan. So first, what I'd like to do is give you a sense of the recent history in Pakistan. You know, I, I, as I think people have already spoken about the mainstream media frames natural disasters very, very poorly. When it comes to the floods in Pakistan, the inadequacy of their treatment was only exacerbated by the frames of the war and Islamophobia and things like this. So some sense of the structural and political context in which the floods unfolded is critical. Without it, uh, I would argue, one can't make any sense of the toll that the, the, that the waters have taken on Pakistan and, and its poor. Um, and then in the second part, I want to argue, and really I shouldn't overstate the extent to which this is an argument, as opposed to just an observation of some very sad facts, the, that precisely this same policy package, i.e. neoliberalism, is being forced on the Pakistani people amidst ongoing war and in the climate of acute crisis following the recent floods. The exact same stinking cocktail of bad economics and ruling class rapaciousness is under the aegis of a 25-month IMF plan, which Pakistan is currently... Uh, unfortunately engaged in, is in the process of being implemented. So these are the sort of two things that I want to do. Um, so the first thing is the history of neoliberalism in Pakistan. Um, there can be some discussion about, about the precise year to which you date the neoliberal turn. Um, a strong case could be made for 1977. I don't know uh, how many people are familiar with the history uh, of Pakistan, but that was the year that our second military dictator took, took power in 1977. Um, Ziaul Haq, and he was ably supported by the United States, especially in the 80s when they were concerned with Afghanistan. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, and principally in the interests of time, I'm going to start the narrative in 1988 instead, which is when the first major agreements were signed with the IMF. Um, since that date, Pakistan has had more than a dozen programs of varying scope and significance, um, and that actually that figure, a dozen, refers only to the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, for the purposes of our larger discussion regarding disaster capitalism, it's relevant to note that the majority of these agreements have been scandalously anti-democratic in their implementation. Uh, so while 1988 is officially the year of Pakistan's transition back to something like democracy, the agreements with the IMF of that same year were actually decided upon by a caretaker government the day before the accession of the elected prime minister, Benazir Bhutto, to basically had to surrender economic policy. Um, the second, which was an, uh, an enhanced structural adjustment facility and a standby arrangement in 93 to 94, was also the handiwork of an interim government and not an elected government. Um, that tells you something about, obviously, uh, the nature of disaster capitalism. Um, the plans, I think, as people will be familiar, the plans embodied all of the orthodoxies of their day. The fiscal deficit was to be cut, the public sector was to be downsized, subsidies were to be removed, trade was to be liberalized, the tax structure to be reformed. Um, the results were devastating. Uh, the, the overall growth rate of the Pakistani economy fell well below trend levels and appreciably below the average of the 1980s. The rate of growth of manufacturing plummeted, uh, falling to 5% from an average of 9% between 80, 1980 and 1988. Public sector employment halved, and this is actually quite critical, from 1991 to 1998, which took a very, very grave toll on the labor movement. Uh, and the percentage of the population living under the poverty line basically doubled from uh, 1988 to 1999. In effect, the neoliberalism of the 90s finished what the militarism of the, uh, of the 1980s had started. Uh, Zia's coup had marked the beginning of a transition away from a development model headed by an activist interventionist state. While the pace of this change was slower than many had expected at the time of the takeover, its general trajectory was unmistakable. Both of Zia's predecessors, uh, Ayub Khan from 1958 to 1969 and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto from 90, uh, 1971 to 1977, had represented in different ways a sort of economic illiberalism that now had little place in the shifting winds of the 1980s. Um, with the advent of the IMF program in 1988, development expenditure, which had already begun to make way for the military uh, budget and for debt servicing in the federal budget, bore the brunt of hawkishness on the fiscal deficit. I had a nice graph which I was going to show, but basically you see that from a, from a high of 10% of GDP um, in 1976 to 1977, 
Uh, development spending had collapsed to 2% of GDP by 2000. Spending on health and education completely stagnated. The former averaged about 0.7% of GDP in the 90s and 0.6% in the 2000s. And while the, the highest estimates of the education uh, budget put it at a woeful 2.1% of GDP in the 90s and 2000s. And uh, countries at comparable income levels to Pakistan spend at least a one and a half to two times that. Um, sorry, last one. Oh, this is, yeah. So... Of course, because, because IMF programs make the provision of loans conditional on policies that, you know, we're very familiar with this, the conditional on policies that have over and over again proven ruinous for the economy undergoing adjustment, by the end of the decade, Pakistan found itself in the throes of a devastating debt crisis. Despite having paid, these statistics are precious, despite having paid $36 billion to foreign creditors in the 1990s, Pakistan added $15 billion to its debt stock bringing its total outstanding external debt to over $32 billion in 2000. And the present decade has been basically a very similar story. Despite paying $45 billion in servicing on an external debt between 2000 and 2010, Pakistan has added $20 billion to its debt to it. It's in, this, it's in the context of this history, then, the floods must be understood. About the scale of the devastation that the waters have wrought, little needs to be said. The lives of more than 20 million of Pakistan's poorest people, is basically the rural poor, uh, were totally uprooted. At its peak, one-fifth of the country had been submerged, devastating a staggering number of schools, hospitals, bridges, roads, homes, etc. Um, yesterday I was reading in the newspaper that the ILO put out this estimate saying that about five million jobs have been lost as a result of the floods. Um, estimates of total reconstruction costs vary widely. The most often quoted estimates of 10 to 15 billion dollars dwarf the amount of aid pledged by the international community thus far. One minute. We'll just have more, you'll have more time during Q&A. Oh, okay. okay. Um, all right, well then I won't, I won't be able to get to the second part, then that's fine. Two minutes then. Uh, okay. Two or three minutes. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, okay, so, so let me just finish this thought then. The, the most often, so the estimates for reconstruction are about 10 to 15 billion dollars. The people know how much Obama is spending in Afghanistan. The, the total represents about one-third to one-half the money Obama has committed to funding the surge in Afghanistan, which was $33 billion, right? Only yesterday, Oxfam noted that only 38% of the UN's $2 billion appeal has been funded. Um, given that Pakistan is likely to send $3 billion to foreign creditors this fiscal year, it means that for every dollar that has arrived in flood-related assistance uh, through the UN, almost four are leaving to service the foreign debt. And when you include all the other pledges that have been made, uh, the vast majority of which haven't been honored, which is actually a very similar story to Haiti, twice as much money is leaving as debt servicing than is entering as, as flood-related aid. Um, let me see. Uh, I'll just finish with the first part, and then we can talk about the second part later. Um, so, what I, basically, the case that I'm trying to make to you is that you can't understand the damage that the floods have, have caused through the framing of, you know, uh, na natural disasters that the mainstream media is fond of, right? The structural uh, explanations are very important. And I'll just speak to one more thing. Uh, there, I had a few other th uh, thoughts here, but let me just speak to one statistic that for me brings this out. So the, the, one of the effects of neoliberalism right through the decline of development spending and things like this has to been to gut the infrastructure of the country, infrastructure spending and things like that. So um, state capacity has been pillaged in Pakistan over the last 20 years. One uh, statistic that's very relevant to the floods, the damage of the floods, comes from this 2006 World Bank report. Um, Punjab, which people are familiar with uh, geography of Pakistan, Punjab is sort of the heartland, the, the most populated province. Punjab, this World Bank report noted, should be investing an average of about $0.3 billion a year in replacement budget for its irrigation infrastructure and similar amount for maintenance of its irrigation uh, infrastructure. In fact, the World Bank noted there is actually no budget for uh, replacement, and the government of Punjab's budget for maintenance is about 1 billion rupees, which is about 6% of the benchmark estimate cost, right? So this gives you an idea of, so why, why did the embankments break in place after place? Why was the irrigation infra infrastructure so poorly maintained? There's no money, right? It's been, the country has been pillaged through uh, the history of neoliberalism. Um, I have some stuff here about the current IMF plan, but uh, since time is short, I can just leave it. If people have questions, we can talk about it. Okay. In the wake of such life disruptions, as these neoliberal formations take root in political and economic cracks, 
How is it simultaneously affecting the collective consciousness of a people? If you can briefly talk about just uh, the psychological effects that you are noticing in the people on the ground. Uh, so we'll start at the, my left here. If you could quickly say, you know, two sentences. Thank you. Being disenfranchised means you have no voice. So, so um, in terms of Haitians, there is a level of disconnect um, between, let's say, the Haitians in, in the diaspora and the Haitians in Haiti. Um, psychologically, I think the Haitians in the diaspora, many of them um, prefer the CNN story. They prefer approval. And a lot of times, um, that undermines the Haitians in Haiti who are actually on the ground vocalizing they want to end the UN occupation. They want to end to the assets of the country being pillaged. So we have that sort of disconnect where forced assimilation has its, um, uh, uh, has wrought its divisions in Haiti, has wrought its divisions with what I do. You know, I'm considered the, um, the, the, the Haitian who speaks against Clinton, where some of the PhD Haitians at the UN think Haiti, uh, Clinton is Santa Claus come to help develop Haiti. We have that disconnect. I can go, I mean, I can't do it in two minutes, but in terms of the earthquake, you have, you have, you know, 300,000 people gone in 33 <coughs> seconds and a whole city, even the National Palace, destroyed. The trauma of that. Um, you know, when I got to Haiti and um, um, a woman who was part of the Haitian Lloyd leadership was constantly saying, can you hear her voice, Zili? She's, she's in there, my daughter, can you hear? It was like four days later. She could still hear the daughter calling for her to, 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 to help her up. Um, and that sort of powerlessness is something that we live with every day. It's and it goes for the diaspora in many ways because you know the United States um, uh, uh, shut down the, the the entrance into Haiti, so many of the diaspora couldn't go to Haiti um, and had to go through the Dominican Republic. The idea, I mean, people said to me, you know, I'm I'm going to get there, whatever, however, and I'm going to find my family, but because we have mass graves. And a lot of people were shoved into those mass graves and nobody bothered to maybe take a picture. There's a lot of, I don't know how do you say it, but it's just like, you don't know. Uh, you know, a lot of our people died in Haiti and we're still trying to confirm if, where are they? Are they in somebody's camp? So there's a lot of trauma and psychological um, 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 trauma going on in Haiti at the moment. But I have to say before I, just finish that we are a people of resistance. We, we look at the evil and we confront it. We don't turn our face. And that's, that's, that's I think, is the Haitian courage. All right, thank you. Uh, Beverly, I know you work in Haiti, so do you want to comment on that and uh, from your experience? Sure, and based on what I have experienced being in New Orleans, I would echo everything that Ezuli said. What I have found in both Haiti and New Orleans is tremendous trauma, a sense of utter disbelief among the majority that they are actually being neglected in this way. Just shock that truly, this many days later they're in the Superdome, truly this many months later they're still in refugee camps, and really what I see to this day in New Orleans where you never go one day without hearing the word Katrina, and what I'm now seeing in Haiti is really collective depression. But in both places you have a people who've long struggled and there is this spirit of resistance, but it's only among those really who are given an opportunity to have information and to participate. Because I would say in both populations there are so many people who are thoroughly excluded. And that's really the role of popular movements is to help people get information and know how to actively mobilize. And when they're given that, what I see is a tremendous desire to fight back and to change in both of those situations. Thank you.
Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak in one of my other points under the cover of answering this question. Um, so so the, the issue related, I mean, the psychological issues are obviously there, right? I mean, the, the trauma is immense as a result of the flow. You can imagine, obviously. Um, but but why I wanted to speak to this, this sense of exclusion. And so the, the policies that are being implemented in Pakistan right now under the aegis of the IMF reform, um, I, I, just the one thing that I want to, to mention is their complete complete uh, opacity, the, the lack of transparency. So for example, this is, this is a, a precious example that I, I thought I have to share with you all. Um, so the, the, the government is being told to cut its fiscal deficit, right? And the, the reform program um, is demanding that subsidies be cut, uh, so on, on food, the price of food, the price of electricity, the price of petrol, etc., etc., is skyrocketing. Um, the last budget that was announced this summer had already seen some of these cuts, and so the military spending and payments on the public debt amounted to half of the federal budget. This was after everything else had been cut, development spending included. Um, in the aftermath of the floods, these are the two things I'll mention and then I'll pass it on. Um, in the aftermath of the floods, this basically has only become worse. Um, our, our government has decided that money for reconstruction and relief efforts will actually be fun be found by slashing the already small development budget and accelerating the pace of subsidy reduction. And this is what I wanted to share in particular. Astonishingly, the military budget for the coming fiscal year, rather than being targeted for cuts, will actually be 20% larger than was already announced in, in the summer. And to drive on this point about disaster capitalism and its relation to democracy or lack of democracy, the only reason that we know this is because journalists found the information in a report that the Pakistani government released to the IMF. In other words, in the summer they had announced that our military budget will be, I think it was somewhere in the region of 400 million, uh, billion rupees, right? And then later, journalists found in a report that the government released to the IMF that, oh, actually the military budget is 110 billion rupees bigger than they had announced. And no one knew this except for journalists who found it out through the IMF. Well, uh, I will not add anything to it. It will be just a repetition um, because uh, whenever people are going through tremendous uh, suffering, um, of course, they come to a state of shock. But uh, I do believe and I've seen it in the history of the Congo through all the struggles that we've had, you know, having Kimpa Vinta rising up in the Congo as a woman warrior who fought the Portuguese. You know, she was killed at stake. You know how she was 21 years old. You know, a 21 year old Congolese who fought the Portuguese, but unfortunately was caught and killed. You, know, you have Simon Kimba, who was a community organizer before you even knew of Obama. You know, mobilized people, had access to Marcus Garvey's newspaper in the 1900s, written in English, but somehow he learned how to read it and spread the word of uh, you know, mobilizing Congolese for uh, sovereignty. You have um, Lupungu II, who told the King of Belgium in uh, the 1930s, they needed to leave. In 1936, he was hung in front of the Congolese people. Patrice Mumba, elected, democratically elected uh, by the Congolese people as the, uh, our first prime minister. Within weeks, deposed, within months, assassinated. The uh, movement of um, democracy in 1990s, 1996, where Congolese came together and wanted to remove a dictator. And now, with the chaos that's happening, you still have stories, but you don't hear about it. I read it one time. That was the Boston Globe published an article of a village in the Ituri who fought the LRA. They let the UN know that the LRA was coming, they didn't come. They let the Congolese military know about it, they didn't come. They actually made homemade guns and protected the village. That's the only story in the 12 year history that I've seen in the Western media of a journalist who actually took the gut to share what the Congolese are doing within uh, the ground. But People get tired of get being sick and tired. So I know that the people are organizing and they will fight it, even though it may be a um, tremendous pain in them. All right, thank you, Kambali. We have a question in the back, Bill. And uh, then Ronald and the guy in the green shirt. Okay. Um, I, I, I'd like to uh, approach this from a slightly different starting point. Um, you know, going back uh, in, say, mid 20th century history, uh, we have theorists uh, like Paul Durand, Ernest Mandel, Paul Sweezy, and many others 
um, who have continually talked about the endemic crisis of capitalism. And we, we, we can argue whether capitalism has been endemically in crisis or not. There's been periods of crisis. Um, and I think there's been periods where it has not been in crisis. But ever since 2008, when, when the US banking system collapsed, um, when banking systems in Europe collapsed, uh, we're seeing some, some kind of uh, structural, some, something very structurally wrong with capitalism, global capitalism. Uh, not simply a crisis of capitalism, but a deteriorating structure. And I think um, when it comes to disaster capitalism, what we see being played out in Africa, in South America, in Asia, in Pakistan, uh, and now in India with, with uh, Obama's visit there, is something vastly different than, than the way it's played out before. So my, my question is, in the absence of uh, really potent revolutionary movements throughout the world, throughout the South, um, in the absence of a second dominant global <coughs> superpower like the Soviet Union, um, how do you see capitalism playing out? What, what, what's, I, I, I'll, I'll ask you to be superstars. How would it play out in the South? as well as how is it going to play out in the advanced capitalist countries? What's, what's the relationship between what's happening in the South and what's happening in the North that's different now? Okay, who would take, who would like to take on this question? Let's take, let's Oh yes, let's get a couple more questions. Um, did someone here on this side have a question? No? Okay, so. Let's take these two questions. Go ahead. Either one, uh, Ronald and then uh, uh, Yeah, both, yeah, starting with you. Go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to say that I think um, the word uh, uh, disaster capitalism is rather a euphemistic word. I think the more appropriate word is fascistic capitalism because that's what it's doing to the, to the world in, in particular. And that, that's what I wanted to say, that this is a class question that's on the table here. People have to pick up that idea that it is a class question and not segmented about nationalities or races or any of that sort of thing. This is what capitalism does and it's starting to do the same thing in the United States. That's why industry has left the United States, manufacturing in particular. So I, I just wanted to you know, add that comment that okay. this is really fascist capitalism. Thank you. We'll take the next question. Yeah, well, um, I just had a question for the lady. The, um, back in January, uh, I read some reports, uh, besides the one about oil, you know, which is uh, very, um, a very strategic resource in Haiti. Um, I mean, w w what you just said, I mean, it's obvious that it's true. Uh, also, I read some reports um, that some uh, CEOs, some companies, some corporations flew to Haiti to um, survey perhaps the terrain in north of Haiti to build some kind of resort. Uh, how true is this? Could you just... Okay, and we'll take uh, one last question in the back. Uh, so one of the things that struck me, I mean, thank you all, it was, it was really enlightening. One of the things that struck me in the presentations was that um, one of the things that we've been hearing, particularly around Pakistan, but clearly around other things as well, has been the way in which security as a frame enters the way in which disaster is dealt with. And I think that's something that is different from earlier periods of dealing with disaster. Not that that security didn't enter. For example, when there was a crisis in Haiti, there was you know 20,000 nurses volunteered to go from here. And instead, there were you know military troops that were sent. Because, I mean, so, you know, I mean, there were examples after examples. I mean, Adhanir and I have talked about uh, you know, the way in which that has been framed. So in your comments, as you're wrapping, if you could just mention the manner in which the U.S. military establishment structures and justifies its presence through an argument of security that really, 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 really needs to be dismantled. Right. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll include, oh, one more question. Yeah. In regards to the Congo, um, I guess I'm just thinking a race issue. I mean, we're speaking about black and brown countries in particular, specifically these 
Um, I don't know. I, like, I guess I'm just thinking about these things. And I'm also thinking, I, I sort of another question that's tangential to this. Can, can you guys speak very briefly about the sort of uh, mounting or uh, non or not mounting uh, left resistance movements uh, sort of showing up within these within these um, uh, various nations and sort of like has there been an increase in I mean has there been a um, an organizing or an increase by uh, membership of uh, you know communist party um, membership has there been um, uh, attacks on uh, uh, the violent attacks on okay. the wealthy classes of these. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. So we'll start here with uh, Haiti and your needs, and then we'll go on to Pakistan and Congo. Very quickly, our closing comments. Um, you know, with reference to your question about um, um, how do I see capitalism playing out? Oh, I'm sorry. How do I see um, capitalism playing out? It's, is it different from the, to the you know, 19th century? I, I want to speak as a Haitian woman, as a, as a, as a, as a descendant of Jean-Jacques Dessalines. You know, all of these abstracts, capitalism, socialism, you know, for me, as, as a Haitian person, what does that do, all of these theories? And I, and I prefer to look at what, what the Western so-called civilization does and then covers it up with names like capitalism. So, 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 because in essence, you see Bechtel and all of the, the affiliates of the Pentagon, they get to make all that money because they have a monopoly and that's not a free market. You see? So I'm not gonna sit around and talk about capitalism when I don't see it really working or existing. That, that quote I was talking about is Judge Bush, is Bush saying, I've abandoned free market principles to save free market principles. What we see in Haiti is a reduction of tariffs in order to benefit foreign companies. What we see in Haiti is a monopoly of the oligarchy in order to, so that the young men in Cité Soleil cannot build their business. There's no free market for them. So free market, to me, is, is given to people like Bill Clinton and his cronies, and, and, and those people at the top of what they call the global elite. But in, in Haiti right now, to give you an example, uh, Miss, Mrs. Clinton's State Department brought us a gift of Monsanto seeds. Now this is after her husband apologized for, for destroying Haitian agriculture. So as earthquake relief, they gave us Monsanto seeds. Why? Monsanto wants more marketplace. And it uses the federal arm of USAID to get its marketplace where it couldn't do it if directly. So, so, so I, don't, I don't look at the capitalism. I mean, what is that? You know, in Alaska, they have a share of their revenues, of their oil revenues. Isn't that socialism? Why is it that Haitians can't say, I want, I want the assets of my country to be used to, to, to bring about health care, to, to, to subsidize the public sector? And it, it, at this moment, during the 11 months, okay, during the 11 months of the earthquake, the, um, the, 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 the businesses, have profited. They've extended the legislation for assembly plans to Korean factories. They've extended to the Brazilians. They've extended our labor. Brazilians get paid ten dollars a day. Us at three dollars. Now Brazilian textile companies could come to Haiti because the United States has extended that privilege to the Koreans, to the Brazilians, and so forth, and the Koreans. So we are used just that we were used in slavery. And um, capitalism is just a word that they used and, 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 and as a tool. Thank so, you so much. We'll um, right there. Okay, so, someone did ask me a question directly about, I guess, the North. And um, all I can say is Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton. <laughs> and um, Royal Caribbean is, 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 is an organization that's taken over a Haitian port. 
um, and, and they have a, a, a business deal with BET, they have a business deal with, and so they want to exploit. And what you have to understand is that the United States has decided because of environmental degradation that, that Americans won't allow here in America to use Haiti, deep water ports, for things that it couldn't do in America. And so that's their plan for the north of Haiti to use for Liberté as an oil refinement place. As a, so that's our purpose to them. They would love to just find the country with nobody in it. You know, if Haitians could just disappear, it would be just, just fantastic for them. Um, so that, I guess, you know, that's about it. Um, okay. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll just address the one about the security corporations. Um, I would encourage everybody to read Jeremy Scahill's work. It's brilliant on the contracts in Iraq and the contracts in Haiti. And among the very first contracts that were granted in Haiti after the earthquake were security companies. Um, and um, they just swept in. And what I think is interesting about the fact that so many contracts go to security companies. This is an ideology that's being promulgated. Whether you call it disaster capitalism or disaster fascism or whatever, it's an ideology. And for ideologies to work, you have to have buy-in from a people. And in order to have buy-in, for example, from the US people, there has to be a propaganda mechanism. And so I think it's very important to convince people that the folks who are in these places are savages, I said the word before, and I've heard it a lot in New Orleans, and you hear it relative to Haitians, and that they're uncontrollable, they're unmanageable. I mean, look at the case studies. Haiti, they all believe in voodoo, you know? They're weird freaks, devil worshippers. New Orleans, we all know that every black person there is a thief. The Congo, well, we all know the Congo's in Africa. Africa is the dark continent. Pakistanis, aren't they Arabs? Aren't they Muslims? You know, we're told to be terrified of all of these people. And I think that that terror is really important in order for us to have, you know, either acquiescence or total quietude and lack of dissent. And so what do you need for that? You have to show that there is a legitimation. So sending in the US military as the first response, as happened in Haiti, and sending in military or security corporations not only rewards Clinton's friends et al., but also acts as a legitimating factor that you see there really is a need for this to exist. Thank you. Um. I guess I, I'll, I'll try and address your question. I think that someone should write a book about that. Maybe you should write a book about it. It's a, it's a huge question, right? Um, I mean, in, in terms of the short-term future for capitalism in Pakistan, um, it, it depends. It depends what you. It depends what exactly you mean. But for the short term, the balance of forces is such in Pakistan that I don't myself see anything but austerity and retrenchment and things like that. The question obviously is whether that can resolve the structural problems that capitalism faces and that that I think is a much bigger question that I'm not qualified to answer or whatever. But um, this relates also to uh, the question about the left. Um, the, the trade union movement through neoliberalism in Pakistan took a real, real hit, right? I mean, the, I mentioned the statistic about public sector employment having um, from 91 to 98, and, and the trade union movement was concentrated in the public sector. So in terms of, in terms of short, -term, short term rebound for the left, I think there's very little, um, very little potential. In the longer term, obviously one can hope. There were some very big strikes, and maybe I'll just end with this because this is something that people should know about Pakistan. Um, the whole framing of Pakistan is that, you know, as, as Beverly was saying, is through the lens of the war on terror. And people don't realize that there are peasants and there are workers and there, are, there is struggle, however weak it might be. So I'll, let me just end with this anecdote. Um, over the summer, there were 100,000 people in the city of Faisalabad, which is one of Pakistan's largest industrial cities, who went on strike for, I think it was like 15 to 16 days or something. They completely shut the city down. There were power loom workers, right? Most people haven't heard about this. CNN certainly didn't tell you about this, right? But they won. They actually ended up winning. Um, what, the, what happened was they won, um, the, the government had promised a minimum wage increase and it hadn't applied to the power loom sectors. They went on strike and they won and they benefited 250,000 workers, which in turn benefited, you know, a million and a half, uh, a million, 
500,000 uh, people as a result of the benefits to their families and things like that. So if people are interested in sort of real working class organizations, real resistance in Pakistan, I encourage you to look this movement up. It's called the Labor Aumi Movement, Q-A-U-M-I Movement. And there's a bunch written about it. Someone wrote a piece on MR Zine um, about it, which is a, it was a lovely piece. Um, so I encourage you to look it up. I, so I guess I'm saying two things. One, you know, let's acknowledge that we shouldn't, we shouldn't overestimate our own strength. No one benefits from that. But so, we're in a weak moment. At the same time, it exists and it's, it's moving wherever it might be. Kambali, last comments? I uh, think uh, Laura discussed and already touched on the other point, so I'll touch on the race issue. Uh, I don't abide by that. Uh, the reason why is they watched the women being raped in Sarajevo. They didn't do shit. Sorry, they didn't. Same thing also during the Holocaust. They really watched that. The U.S. was playing both sides. They watch that. So for me, it's not really about the race. We may get caught up. Of course, racism exists as individuals, but the mass atrocities that are taking place, I cannot blame that on race. That is actually purposefully letting the people die in the Congo, depopulating the area, getting access to the resources. So why people do not know? It's the amount of money that's being traded within the Congo. We're talking about billions. The wealth of the Congo is $24 trillion. Do you want that in the hands of Africans? No. Congolese? No. Why? The Congressional Budget Office in 1982 wrote a document called Cobalt Policy. Why? So, P Americans do not know this. In 1981, there was a shortage of color TV here in the US. Do you know why? Because of two rebellions that took place in the Congo in the 77 and uh, 79, I think. Uh, Shaba 1 and Shaba 2. That disrupted cobalt production in the Congo. That really made the legislator here find out, okay, if our cobalt coming from the Congo, what do we have to do? The document says this, the U.S. is vulnerable for cobalt production because it doesn't produce any cobalt. And cobalt is coming from Congo and Zambia, the area that is unstable. It poses two vulnerability. One, military nature. In case of a war, you can wage war with our cobalt. Second is economic, which Americans actually felt with the color TV. So you know what the policy was? We're going to support a leader who's going to provide that access there. So people live on the land. They can benefit like people in Alaska. So what do you have to do? You have to displace them in mass. What's the best way to displace people in mass? Creating atrocities that may not use a lot of bullets. So some of the tools being used right now is rape and mutilation of people in public. So you have shift of population in areas that used to be, uh, uh, that, that's rich in mineral. Last point, right now, there is an oil deal in the east of Congo. People who've been watching it heard a lot about the LRA. In Eastern Congo, in Ituri, in the area where there is oil exploitation today, that's the area where LRA mysteriously appeared. It kept on killing people. They're not there anymore. They're supposedly in Central Africa. So how come people have shifted from that uh, from the area? Surprisingly, there is now an oil company. So that's not about the color of the skin. That's about what they want to get there, and they will make sure that all of us do not know the real reality of who are the real people. And the last joke is Forbes magazine. They published a list of the 400 richest men. I just read it. I didn't see the Rockefellers on there. I didn't see the rather shot. I saw number 20, John Paulson here, and I know that list, right, has nothing to do to the people who really make the decisions around the world to get access to the resources that benefit the less than 1%. All right, we want to thank the panel. Thank you for coming from all the places that you came to be a part of this panel.